Welcome back, everyone. Continuing the developer track here, we have the VP of Product Engineering at TuppleJump. Please welcome Helena. Thank you. <laughs> oh, can you guys hear me? Thumbs up. Sounds good in the back. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for coming to my talk on streaming analytics. Um, my name is Helena Edelson. A little bit about me real quick is I'm a committer and contributor to several open source products, uh, projects. <laughs> Akka, I contributed to new features to Akka cluster. Um, the Spark Cassandra connector, and a uh, new um, contributor to PhiloDB. And back in the day, when I, a long time ago, when I used to do Java Spring integration, things like that. Um, so I've previously been a senior cloud engineer at several different companies, including VMware. Um, but now I'm at TumbleJump. A little bit about TumbleJump: we're a, we do, we have several, uh, two different arms of the company. Really, we do consulting, but we're also a big data blender. Uh, so we can take disparate data sources and through machine learning and analytics into it what the uh, analyst wants to do. And we accept data through both streaming and non-streaming. Uh, so what we're going to talk about, um, I want to, first of all, identify the problem domain with regard to streaming analytics. Um, most of you are familiar with that. Who is doing streaming right now in production, streaming analytics? OK, great. Um, so this isn't going to be an intro talk into Spark Streaming. I've done a lot of those talks before. Um, I'm going to give an example use case so that we have sort of a context for what I'm going to talk about. And then we're going to talk about rethinking the architecture, <clears throat> a very brief look back at where we've been just a few years ago to what has come up recently, and then um, something I want you guys to be able to think about now. Do we really need things? And then the general smack architecture, if you're not familiar with that. <clears throat> Delivering meaning from a flood of data. So the problem domain, if we had something like requirements, it might sound like need to build scalable, fault-tolerant, distributed data processing systems that can handle massive amounts of data from disparate sources, oftentimes you know, hundreds of data sources with differing data structures. Uh, this is what that means to me when I read something like that. How to build adaptable, to me that's very important, um, elegant systems, because we've all seen spaghetti architectures, to me that's really annoying, um, for complex analytics and learning tasks to run as large-scale clustered data flows. Uh, it's very difficult when we're dealing with things like uh, terabytes and petabytes of data. And I had to add the little Yoda in there because I had never heard of a Yoda byte. Apparently, that costs about $100 trillion in terms of data center fees. <laughs> so delivering meaning, we all have different uh, requirements sometimes. And really, it depends on your domain, whether you're in finance or um, healthcare. You might be dealing with it's OK to have uh, second latency. Or in finance, you might want sub-second latency. It really depends on your use case. Uh, we're all dealing with disparate data sources. How do we combine that uh, data with different schemas? Billions of events per second in our streaming architectures. We have to provide systems that do both uh, high latency batch plus uh, low latency stream processing. And we have to do things like, and there's many more like this, but aggregating uh, in the stream, we need to be able to access our historical data so that we can aggregate and uh, match on that for our um, for our data that we end up persisting. So all of that we have to do while we're handling things like massive event spikes. Because it's one thing, right, to make our little prototypes and show the executives and say, look, we can do this. But actually deploying that into production in such a way that we can sleep at night um, is another thing. When we're dealing with things like bursty traffic, uh, fast producers and slow consumers, and you, can, you get into that a lot more when you get into working with Kafka, for example. One tough one is things like network partitioning. And when you have out of sync systems, people do PhDs on that. Um, data centers down, and a lot of that can be resolved working with particular technologies, which I'm going to talk about. And then situations like, wait, we've DDoSed ourselves from incredibly fast streams or bursty streams. And my friends that are speaking next are going to be talking about that with regard to back pressure. And situations like auto scaling issues, when we have a lot more traffic and we're auto scaling up, and then we start to auto-scale down, how do we not lose our data? 
busy engineers. And all of that while we're uh, trying to stay within our AWS and Rackspace budget. OK, so just trying to put this whole talk into a concept. Um, here's a particular use case that I'm uh, a little familiar with, hunting the hunter. Uh, so using cybersecurity, for example, say you're a company that does you know, endpoint uh, detection. Oftentimes, there's two different branches of this kind of use case. There's a offline and then an online streaming and cloud architecture. So the first part is um, adversary profile and profiling and hunting. A lot of times, a cybersecurity company, for example, will be called in once there's been a breach or an attempt of a breach. And it's the uh, analysts that come in. And they're the ones that, um, because there wasn't, they, like a company might have had a malware uh, checking software. And a lot of times, that's not what actually happens. Uh, what really happens is the attackers have you know, stolen uh, the credentials for two-factor auth and come in through their VPN. Malware isn't going to be detecting that. And so the analysts come in. And because there wasn't their software sitting on all the agents, um, you know, both the servers and the, uh, and the workstation machines, they don't have that data of what happened in that actual event flow. So the analysts are able to come in there and figure that out, what actually happened. And then um, also what you're trying to do in that scenario is gather enough data so that you can start to profile those adversaries so that when you are detecting them in the stream and you do have um, anomalies that you can detect, you can start to profile who is actually doing that, what nation states are actually doing that. And then the stream processing component that's where you get into massive amounts of data processing. <laughs> you're dealing with all of your um, machine event ingestion. You're doing your endpoint intrusion detection, anomalies, um, trying to detect when there's any kind of attack or compromise. And then through, uh, while you're processing that data in your stream, you're also trying to do machine learning so that you can start to proactively respond to that. Um, so we're trying to train our models from our historic data that we gather and predict potential threats, profiling for adversary identification. And just a quick sort of what does that data look like? It's usually a lot of log event data, um, user activity records, system operations, and metrics, which I think we probably all deal with, um, many disparate data sources, and wildly differing data structures. So what kind of data is that? It's, uh, if you think about, you know, there's an agent uh, distributed on every machine, like I said, workstation or a server. One machine can generate over two terabytes of data per day. That is when you're tracking millions of devices. Um, you've got a million writes per second. Oftentimes, that kind of traffic is very bursty. Uh, sometimes you have a high percentage of writes and a smaller percentage of reads, or vice versa. And you have to be able to handle both of those situations. So given all of that, <laughs> Uh, now that we've put that into some kind of context, let's talk about the architecture. OK. <laughs> so this is an example that's actually um, a system, sort of describes a system that I worked on maybe three years ago. And I think it's a pretty common architecture for what things used to look like then. I was actually using Kafka back then, but um, I don't think most people were quite yet. It was pretty young then. It was a little bit more difficult to work with. Um, so I, there actually wasn't scalding here in this infrastructure. There was pig with a Java API and a Python API. And I was really interested in scalding at the time, being a Scala engineer. And uh, I was coming from the cloud, the asynchronous event-driven cloud um, part of the, you know, what we do. And then I came into this batch world working with Hadoop and um, started to add in a, our scalding layer. Um, it was really cool. Uh, I realized that we needed, there wasn't anything yet that was automating the whole process from end to end, like being able to add a new job. None of that was automated, so I automated the whole thing. But what was really interesting about this to me was that you have your collection. Um, portion, all of you know, different devices, your social media, all of these different data emitters, um, sending information to, usually this is a highly secure sort of collection system. Um, not every infrastructure needs something like that, but uh, mine did. And um, from there, you're getting your information adjusted into uh, throwing it into S3 buckets, usually by date. Uh, 
but what's interesting to me was that uh, the requirements that I had was to, for example, uh, collect all this data and uh, aggregate and try and run jobs that, for example, were, you know, let's look at this event and the specifics of that event for uh, 24 hours in a day, and I want the results of that, that kind of thing. So we're collecting all this information, and it's just building up and building up, and we're not. By the time I actually run the job, I was using Azkaban for job scheduling. By the time it's actually running, 99% of our data is completely stale. So coming from an asynchronous, event-driven um, environment, this seemed a little odd to me. Um, but I really do like Scalding. Scalding, if you're not familiar with it, it's in Scala. It's over cascading. Works incredibly well with Hadoop. Enter streaming with our uh, streaming analytics requirements. So now we have things like I need fast access to historical data on the fly for predictive modeling with real-time data from the stream. This is actually really hard. Um, the thing is, though, it's not a stream, it's a flood. <laughs> that becomes with, when you're dealing with infrastructure and 24-7 uh, uptime, that's a problem. So uh, if you look at companies that do a lot of um, event handling, like Netflix and LinkedIn, uh, if you look down at the data and gestures portion of that, Netflix doing 50 to 100 billion events per day, uh, LinkedIn doing 2.5 trillion events per day, a petabyte of streaming data, that's a lot of things to worry about that can potentially go wrong. So it's really important, I think, to consider the technologies that you want to use and what are your strategies in terms of uh, fault tolerance, how are you going to handle failure, really making sure that all of these technologies not only are able to handle um, no data loss, but also collaboratively can help and enrich each other. And what that all translates to as far as executives go, do it fast, do it cheap, do it at scale. They don't really care <laughs> as long as we get it right. So some of the challenges that we end up dealing with, um, this is kind of a topic of debate, I think, right now. Not debate, but um, something to really think about. Uh, going from your batch analytics systems to streaming, you don't have to think as much in batch about how do we handle code changes in runtime because it's batch. You can just deploy a new um, version of it. Um, but with streaming, when even though we're distributed across a cluster, if I need to bring some uh, of the systems down, some of the nodes down, because I have code changes in my logic, for example, in the streaming ap applications, how am I going to do that without losing data? Um, how am I going to handle different versions of it? So things like that you really have to start to think about. Um, another thing that's a very huge topic people do PhDs on is distributed data consistency. Uh, ordering guarantees are something we all have to start thinking about, particularly um, when we're um, combining you know, Kafka with Spark or Akka and everything, you know, handle things and processes our data differently. And then handling our, compute, our complex compute algorithms and our machine learning in all of that. And then, of course, don't lose data while you're doing all of it. <laughs> So some common strategies that we all have to use in order to get this work done. Partitioning for scale and data locality. I think data locality is something that people overlook a lot, but in terms of speed, when, that, when that's important to you, um, it's, very, it's very important to then think about what technologies am I using, what is my data model, um, what is my deployment architecture. Replication. Uh, sharing nothing, fault tolerance is huge, uh, and most technologies have a different fault tolerance uh, strategy. Important to be very, very familiar with that. Asynchrony, async message passing, very important. Um, uh, much more important now getting into things like me uh, memory management. Data lineage and reprocessing in runtime, very important when you're dealing with streaming uh, architectures. And then, of course, parallelism, elastic scale, Isolation and uh, something that people overlook a lot, I think, is location transparency. So all of that after streaming, and then we totally geeked out. Uh, we're all familiar with Lambda architecture now. I, uh, until very recently, have been talking a lot about this. <laughs> um, so this is the uh, Wikipedia uh, description of it. A data processing architecture designed to handle massive quantities of data by taking advantage of both batch and stream processing methods. This uh, was coined by Nathan Mars. It was a huge strive, stride forward, and a lot of um, businesses are using this architecture. I stole this from MapR. 
Now, this gives you a very clean representation of it. Uh, if you Google for a lot of images, it'll show you something much more complicated and a bit scary. Um, the thing about this, though, is um, it can be very complicated. It's, a, I think, a very important idea for us. Uh, it's a very good idea, but it can be complicated. So here's another representation of it. Now going back to, for example, that system that I showed you before that I had worked on. We still have our collection, but now we have Kafka back. We can be writing continuously to Kafka. And now enter Spark Streaming. I have Spark and Spark Streaming. I'm, um, in this example, now I'm wrapping Akka around my Spark applications uh, for reasons I'll get into in a, uh, in a bit. Um, what I'm doing here is I am um, asynchronously receiving um, to all of my subscriber applications my data from various Kafka topics. Uh, the first thing I want to do, though, is I want to take that raw data stream and persist it immediately into Cassandra. And from there, then I can do what's, what I think is pretty cool. You can do you know, your aggregation, but primarily you can do a lot of pre-aggregation so that I can have levels of the aggregation that I'm doing for my analytics where some things I know, now, know in the stream right now, I can pre-aggregate for more uh, granular queries are, that are going to happen in the stream later. Um, and you can save these pre -aggregated, uh, this pre-aggregated information in tables in Cassandra. Um, but we've still got, look at that second arrow down below it, we've still got our batch um, data flow. And we also have ingestion for non-analytics streaming uh, components of the system. So what do we think about that? Uh, it's a little bit complicated still. We have a lot of moving parts. We have Kafka. We have many different deployed applications. We have non-analytics applications that need that streaming data. Um, reconciling queries in different places, it gets a little bit complicated. And also, performance tuning and monitoring for so many systems is also hard. So let's look at this one more time. It's a slightly different uh, description of Lambda architecture, a batch system, a stream processing system in parallel. So two systems. Uh, let's think about that for a second. Um, what does this translate to for us? Uh, performing analytical computations and queries in dual systems. I've got duplicate code. Sometimes I've got spaghetti architecture for all of my data flows. And really what that comes down to is a very busy network. Why do we need dual systems? Let's ask, you know, no one really asks that question very often. Um, and I think, I think that's because of as technologies improve, it opens up opportunities for us. Um, so why do we need to support dual systems? It seems a little bit counterproductive now because we can now start to think about a unified system. And I say this very carefully because I know a lot of us have, we work at companies that have a lot invested in our Hadoop systems. And um, it would be, you know, a project to migrate that. Um, but I really, you know, if, if you sit down and think about it, how hard would that really be? Um, if you, I don't think you need a big team. It's better to get like a small team and work very agile, and it can be done. What does that translate to, though? Real-time processing and being able to reprocess when we have code changes in our analytics. Um, also handling fault tolerance, and there's a really good um, blog post, I don't think it's really a blog post, but on the O'Reilly site by Jay Kreps about questioning Lambda architecture that I really recommend people to read. And here's another quick assumption for everyone, since we're on the topic of ETL. <laughs> this is from the Oracle uh, documentation, designing and maintaining the ETL process is often considered one of the most difficult and resource intensive portions of a data warehouse project. Uh, <laughs> and they're like the king of ETL in a way. Um, so what is ETL if you're not familiar with it? It involves extraction of data from one system to another, transforming it, loading it to, into another system, which to me sounds like a lot of movement. And you know, if you're familiar with Occam's razor, that sounds a little bit scary. Like there's got to be a better way. Just because everyone's doing it doesn't mean it's right. So it seems also like unnecessarily redundant, and it's also um, often typeless. Each step can introduce a lot of errors and risk. I've got to start moving a little bit more quickly now. <laughs> um, the main thing on this side I want you to think about is a lot of times in ETL systems, we're parsing and reparsing uh, text data dumps. Why are we doing that? There's absolutely no need to do that. 
what you really need to think about is when you first ingest that data, put it into a format that's typed that the rest of your, the, that your entire infrastructure can use. Do it once. And so this is my one Halloween slide. Hopefully, you guys have all seen Star Wars. <laughs> so let's revisit the stack. Uh, can we remove E from ETL? Yes. When we start to work with things like uh, Scala and Avro, we can have a return to strong typing in the big data ecosystem. This, I think, is one of the biggest takeaways to think about. Instead of text dumps that you need to parse over multiple times, removing the L in ETL. Uh, if data collection is backed by something like Kafka, particularly that becomes an easier thing to have in your infrastructure when you're dealing with billions of events per second. Um, then you can do a real-time fan out as far as your data flow uh, patterns to all of your uh, consumers in an asynchronous fashion. So no more Greek letter architectures and no ETL. And if you're interested in no ETL, there's a great website called noetl.org that you can check out. So here's my nerdy chart really quick. Um, something I wanted you guys to think about in terms of uh, SMAC, and I'm going to get to that in a second. Uh, this totally nerdy chart, really, um, on the left side is all the strategies that I mentioned that we need to think about in order to uh, successfully be deploying and running systems like this. And on the right, the technologies are all, you know, it's Spark, it's Cassandra, Kafka, um, Akka and how they all either exhibit that behavior or also in concert are able to enrich each, enrich each other to achieve that. I think this is very important. SMAC re represents Scala and Spark, Mesos, Aqua, Cassandra, and Kafka. Spark streaming, of course, I'm not going to go into this because we all know about it. But basically, the idea here is having one runtime for streaming and batch processing. So for a very, very simple example, how do I merge historical data with data in the stream? Uh, I think we all know how to create a, a streaming context, but if I have a tuple of an int and a string, um, and I'm reading from text file, why are we parsing files.txt, run it through some kind of function, and then in my Kafka stream, I'm going to take uh, each of those events uh, and map it over a join of that static data. Um, I will say, though, with this, there's um, some interval awareness that you need to have. Um, but this is, I just wanted to give you guys a really basic example of the code. And then we not only need to do analytics on our streaming data. If you remember back with my example use case, we all also need to do machine learning on that data so that we can proactively respond. So I basically need to be able to also, in my stream, train my model from my historic data and run that over my model so that I'm able to actively um, predict what might happen. Mesos we're all familiar with. Um, who here has worked with Akka? Right on. Um, so Akka is many things. It's a really wonderful framework that abstracts our concurrency. It encapsulates our, um, our analytics work and um, easily gives us a remoting. Um, we can use uh, Aqua cluster to give us topology awareness and be able to load balance dynamically between our different applications. Aqua actors, compute isolation, that's what I was trying to remember. Uh, very easy behavioral context switching. Uh, I'm going to start to rush here. Um, in terms of fault tolerance, it's very, very good. Um, very easy to um, customize the type of supervisor hierarchy behavior. You can have, for example, Kafka work being done in an actor, and based on the different uh, exceptions that might be thrown, say, you know, for your different workers, have those have their particular behavior and different actors for your Spark workers. So here's just a very simple example. Uh, usually what I'll do is I'll have some kind of node guardian for each particular node. Um, I'm starting up a temperature actor, a precipitation actor for my weather data. And then I can have things like in that receive function, context become initialized. These are very, very uh, powerful transformations of behavior in Akka actors that you can have. And then uh, Apache Cassandra is something that I've been working with from the beginning of doing big data. Um, I don't think I would do <laughs> any big data project without Cassandra. It's extremely fast, extremely scalable. I can um, replicate my data over all my data centers. I can have one data center go down. My applications never stop. 
uh, survive regional outages. It's very easy to operate. That's the, really the one thing in your infrastructure that you never have to worry about. Uh, also, it's very flexible data models, and there's a huge, huge community. Very, very good for uh, time series work. And the Spark Cassandra Connector is a project that I very recently, well, I'm a contributor to that. Um, uh, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to kind of go faster. Killer Weather is a project that I have on GitHub. It's a reference application, and recently, I think earlier this year, became one of the Datastax reference apps officially. Um, you can look at that for time series with, and it shows, it gives you a good sense of how to construct your data model, and it allows you to, because of the data models, that you, the power of the data model with Cassandra, you can delegate to Cassandra to do a lot of your processing instead of your code and your Spark code, which is really nice. It's very powerful. Kafka, we're all familiar with. I have four more minutes. What am I going to talk about? <laughs> all right, let's talk about uh, just an example of everything pulled together. Here's a sample of a Kafka streaming actor. So this is my primary ingestion uh, actor. Very simple. I'm, in, I'm taking my streaming context. Uh, it's extending a trait, like a custom trait, of my aggregation actor so that not all of my actors have to duplicate any kind of code. I create my Kafka stream. Um, immediately, you'll see right there, I say Kafka stream, save to Cassandra. That's my raw data. I just want to save that out immediately. And then after that, I can start doing some kind of processing. Uh, generally, I might want to separate out my app per sort of partition my actors for specifically what kind of computing they're doing. Um, but this one is just a really simple example of I'm saving off for my pre-aggregated precipitation data so that then once I have this pre-aggregated data, I can later on have that to reference for a query where if I wanted to aggregate, say, for the year, like annual precipitation. I already have a lot of that work done. Uh, here's a, one of the particular actors that was created by that Kafka streaming actor. And here is where you have sort of that encapsulated compute uh, aspect that you get from Akka. I have my actor. It's receiving particular typed requests, my get precipitation, get top K. And so here I'm doing using just Spark core, um, just calling uh, Spark context Cassandra table where I'm reading from those pre-aggregated tables doing my computing, but really notice how I say, instead of collect, I say collect async. This is something that I think people need to think about more in their large-scale data flows, is asynchrony using futures, which uh, is a huge reason to migrate to Scala if you are using Java. And then from there, I can just very easily map all that into my particular uh, outcome case classes, like annual precipitation. And you'll notice the syntax here, I say annual precipitation, pipe to requester. And I'm, uh, if you're a Java person, that's basically returning a void. But I'm returning a unit, which is, uh, I, I don't want to explain that. It might be like a Scala work. But um, <laughs> pipe to means when that future computation is done, I'm going to send that to the requesting actor. Everything is completely done asynchronously. So a new approach. The thing I'm trying to get at for you guys is thinking in terms of one runtime. Uh, we can possibly get rid of all of that Hadoop work if we, if we are able to and just have our one streaming architecture. And you know, with something like Kafka, there's many, many different schedulers out there, as we know. You can use any of those schedulers. But for example, if you're using um, Akka, you can schedule jobs, your batch jobs in your streaming application. It's all one. You're deploying one thing. You're running one thing. You're supporting one thing. I mean, this is a huge difference from what we had before. We can write very, very different applications now. So um, the reprocessing thing, I have one minute, 42 seconds. <laughs> the reprocessing portion, um, so here's still our raw da data streams and our aggregations coming through our Akka application with uh, Kafka streaming and Spark, Spark streaming. And now I can do things like job versioning. Um, something that we work on at TuppleJump is PhiloDB. Um, it's a distributed columnar database designed to run very fast analytical queries. Right now, it's built over Spark and Cassandra. Um, but it allows us to do things. It, it, it naturally has built-in versioning, which when you think of the reprocessing problem for streaming architectures is very important. It also has breakthrough performance levels for, for analytical queries. Um, I don't know if any of you went to the meetup that um, my colleague Evan Chan did last night, but he gave a nice, uh, really nice talk about that. So that kind of combination allows us to simplify our architectures dramatically. 
Um, and that's really the takeaway that I wanted you guys to have. Uh, wrapping up, this is maybe wh where we're coming from, architecture question mark, <laughs> and where we can go, something a lot more streamlined and simplified. And when you think about your entire arc, um, engineering force, you have your ops people, you have engineers, you know, really, how do we make this actually happen? What do we have to support? This is, I think, something to really consider. And this is the SMAC stack. So that's uh, something for you guys to think about. And Tubble Jump, we do consulting as well. Um, and that's our contact information. And please follow me on Twitter. That's it. Thanks. <laughs>